want to direct our attention to meditation four. In meditation four, Descartes explores uh, the reasons why he makes mistakes and how he can stop making them. So this is a discussion of mistakes or errors. In meditation four, Descartes divides the operations of his mind into two different categories. Okay, and this is just an arbitrary division. It's not something that necessarily has to be the case. But for the purposes that he's interested in, namely explaining why he makes mistakes and how he can stop making them, it suffices. And these two, ca uh, two capacities or categories are the will and the intellect. The intellect, we'll start there, is that faculty of knowing that human beings have. It accumulates knowledge. And the intellect is what assembles for us the sensorial perceptions that we have into more systematic, more structured awarenesses of our surroundings. Okay, sensorial impressions are just immediate impulses. The intellect assembles these immediate sensory impulses into a larger, more comprehensive body of knowledge. It gives us an understanding of the nature of the world and our place in it. The will, by contrast, Descartes characterizes as the faculty of choosing. So this is a faculty of knowing, and this, the will, is a faculty of choosing. The will decides, it makes choices about which direction and how we will go about our lives, how we will navigate our lives. And it does so on the basis of the information that is provided to it by the intellect. Okay, so the intellect informs the will. The will makes its choices after accumulating knowledge by means of the operation of the intellect. And again, these are just two arbitrary um, faculties that Descartes has assigned to the mind and characterized the mind in terms of, but it helps him as he's trying to develop a theory of error and mistake. Okay, now Descartes says that the reason why he, Descartes, makes mistakes is because he chooses through his will prior to having assembled a sufficient amount of knowledge. Okay, he chooses before knowing fully what the right choice is. And if you think about your own decision-making process, often in the past I personally have made choices without knowing all the things that I should have known about a particular situation, maybe a particular business relationship or a particular product that I purchased, or maybe a, a larger decision. Okay, and humans often do that, and Descartes thinks that this actually explains why he makes mistakes. Uh, one more pass, he thinks that the will is the choosing faculty, the intellect is the knowing faculty, and the reason why humans err or ha um, fall into error is because, because they're, because of a gap between their will and their intellect. The intellect is a cumulative faculty. It is uh, explainable in terms of more and less. It gradually gathers or accumulates information. The will, by contrast, is a choosing faculty. It's not explainable in terms of more or less. It's explainable in terms of yes or no. Think of it like a light switch, right? The will can, um, can be on or it can be off. It can choose yes or it can choose no. Because of this difference in their uh, natures, the two faculties' natures, uh, Descartes thinks that the reason why he, can, he, Descartes, makes mistakes is because of this gap between the will and the intellect and because the will can choose in the absence of full knowledge just by virtue of the, its nature as a faculty. Okay, um, Descartes actually resolves in the fourth meditation to... Uh, to no longer make mistakes. This is an extraordinary kind of a resolution, but he says if he just waits until he accumulates full knowledge, then he will no longer make mistakes. 
Okay, um, I have serious disagreements with Descartes on the topic of meditation four, and this is one of those areas of disagreement. But Descartes himself seems confident that whenever he makes a decision in life going forward from here, as long as he waits until he has assembled full information about a particular subject matter, then he will be okay. Okay, and he will make the right decision. He won't make mistakes anymore. He won't err anymore. Okay, he seems supremely self-confident that this will be the case. Okay, um, I want to offer two criticisms of Descartes' solution here. Again, his solution is wait until you have enough information and then choose, and you won't make mistakes. Okay, and I want to offer two criticisms of his solution here. Um, one criticism is grounded, I guess, in my Augustinian leanings. So I tend to side with St. Augustine in his explanation of human nature and human behavior. If you remember, Augustine explained human behavior in terms of uh, our propensity to sin. And he said that human beings often are driven by kind of a, a fallen nature which inclines them to do the bad. Okay, it inclines them to uh, wrongdoing. And I guess I'd say from personal experience, there have been times when I have known the good I should, I should do, known what I needed to do, and I've done the bad anyway. Okay, so times when I have had full knowledge of precisely the circumstances that I'm in and precisely what's at stake and why I should make a particular choice in a certain way. And I have chosen the bad anyway, the wrong, wrong choice. Okay, um, this happens on a semi-regular basis. Uh, not that often, but at the end of the workday, I'll be really tired. I'll go down to the vending machine and I'll look at the cookies and I'll think to myself, this is the wrong choice. Right, I'm going to get fat. More clogging of my arteries. And yet, I make the choice for the cookies anyway. I push the button. Okay, knowing full well what they will do to me. This is probably an example of knowing the good you needed to do and not doing it. Because I do it like fully knowing. And the reason why is because in the moment, I actually value more the immediate physical kick that... I get from having a you know a little bag of cookies when I'm real tired, then um, then you know longer term, more less tangible benefits like being healthy in my 70s or something. Okay, um, for Descartes to know the good is to do the good. This is a classic formulation. To know the good is to do the good. If you know the good, then you will do it. If you don't know the good, you won't do it. If you think you know the good, but don't do the good, that's an indication that you didn't truly know the good, according to Descartes. You didn't truly know, in a full sense, the good that you were supposed to do. Because to know the good is to do the good. Okay, it's a straightforward kind of a formulation. And it's not necessarily one I agree with, but it's one that it has been influential. Okay, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, actually, let me go ahead and say why right now, and then I'll talk about the second criticism momentarily. So the Cartesian idea that human beings make mistakes for other reasons than sin is an idea that has, um, although Descartes is a Christian, Still, his idea has had a certain influence in the culture here, especially here in the West, that has gradually displaced the notion of uh, sin in the human mindset. Okay, so I'm speaking more generally now outside of Descartes. Um, 
I heard a sermon not too long ago where the pastor said, these days people seem to have syndromes, not sin. Okay, and the idea was that uh, we try to explain human behavior in terms of other explanations than that we make you know, sinful choices or that we are afflicted with a sinful condition. I think that that's increasingly the case. As I look out in the culture, it's not just the case that people don't necessarily, a lot of people don't necessarily believe that humans are inclined to be bad. Okay, they, they certainly don't seem to do that. But it's also that uh, they don't even have a notion of what sin is these days. It's something that's increasingly common, I think, in the culture. Okay, and those kinds of ideas can be traced back to Descartes. The idea that uh, we can explain away human badness in terms of um, a gap between our faculties, the will and the intellect, and don't have to say that the reason why we are bad is because we have some special, some particular aspect of our condition, namely our sin nature, that inclines us to the bad. Okay, and that's, that's been increasingly influential as the years have gone on. Uh, the second reason why I don't agree with Descartes um, uh, don't agree with Descartes' solution in Meditation 4 is uh, because I don't necessarily buy the idea that we can know all the things we need to know in any particular situation where we make a decision. Okay, so I stand in front of the vending machine, I push the button, I eat the cookies. Uh, that slows down my day by about 30 seconds or whatever. Uh, which means I now won't get hit by the car when I step off the street into the parking lot. Okay, I'm sorry, step off the street corner into the parking lot. Um, you don't know, right? You don't know what's going to happen in the future. You can't know. Part of humans and human life, you can't know everything there is to know about a particular situation. And so while I thought that my choice for the cookies was a bad choice. Maybe it turned out actually to be a life-saving choice because it slowed down my day by 30 seconds and because I didn't get hit by the car. Okay, or to vary up the example, right, my, um, my wife and I uh, have three little kids. Our fourth is on the way in May. Okay, they are all daughters. I'm a very, very proud papa. Um, but my five-year-old recently has... Uh, has started tormenting the three-year-old, uh, you know, probably out of jealousy because the three-year-old is 18 months behind her and is close enough to be a rival. Uh, but she's, she'll say things to her like, um, mommy and daddy don't love you as much as they love me. I know, and I, I've talked to my wife about it and we're just floored, like, where did she get this from? Where is this coming from? Uh, this didn't come from us. Uh, I, I think it's just kind of like I'm Augustinian about this. I think this is coming from the evil in her heart, right? Um, <laughs> but, um, but right, so my wife and I have chosen, we're pro-kid. We think that raising kids, these little daughters, is a good thing that's going to um, contribute to the good of the world, right? We think it'll promote good things in the world. But my five-year-old seems to be on this bad moral trajectory right now. Okay, um, my wife and I have chosen to bring her into the world, but we don't know what she's going to do with her life. Okay, um, she could be the, the next female Hitler, right? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> I certainly hope not, but again, how can you know all of the potential consequences of your actions? Uh, I certainly doubt that Hitler's parents, when he was a five-year-old, thought to themselves, you know, we have we brought the greatest mass murderer of the 20th century into the world. What a thing we have given the world, right? They didn't think that, right? They didn't know. Humans don't know. That's part of the human condition is you do not know all of the things there are to, that need to be known in order to make a perfectly good decision. So for that reason as well, I disagree with Descartes on his theory of error and his resolution no longer to make mistakes. Okay, so the first criticism then is that on Augustinian grounds, it could be argued that um, we sometimes know the good we need to do and don't do it anyway. 
And then on the second criticism is that you can't ever fully know what you need to know in order to always make a good decision whenever you find yourself facing a dilemma. All right, but um, that's the gist of meditation four. Are there any comments or reflections on that? Or fully knowing what the truth is would make me be right, and I thought to myself, there's yeah, there's a bunch of thoughts in that. My my counter against that would have been that some decisions have to be made in the moment, instantly. You can't just wait. For example, let's say if I was working in the emergency room, I can't just wait until I have enough knowledge. I have to do whatever I can to mm -hmm. save that patient. Yeah. And I was also thinking, to know everything would make you God weak have to know everything, even if we think we know a lot, that doesn't mean we know everything there is about a certain topic or a subject. So I just said, you're going to be waiting for a long time <laughs> before you make a decision. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And your emergency room example is just like my example of my daughter, right? Um, so your job is to save the patient when you find yourself in a situation like that. And most of the time that will lead to good in the world. But what if you save the patient and the patient ends up doing horrible things like bombing a plane or something, right? You don't, you just don't know. But your job is to say is to save the patient, and most of the time, that job, that choice to save the patient is the correct choice. Uh, but you know, again, though, you, you you don't ever fully know. So I think that's a good example, Kendra. Okay. Um, let us look at a second issue that arises out of meditation four, and that is actually present as a background issue throughout the whole of the, uh, of the meditation. And that's the metaphysics of moral responsibility. This is a, a key background issue. Metaphysics of moral responsibility. Um, the structural features of humans that pertain to their responsibility morally speaking, for the choices that they make. <clears throat> okay. Um, Descartes is an immaterialist. That is, he thinks that he has a soul as well as a body. Back when we did Plato, if you remember... Um, I think I did this for the Monday section. Um, maybe I just did it for the Wednesday section, but you saw the video anyway. Okay, I mentioned that um, there are two different camps in response to the question, what is a human? Monism? Yes, uh, that's right. Yes, monism. And dualism. Yeah, that's right. Excellent. And the dualists say that we are two things, souls and bodies. And the monists say we are one thing. Some are physicalists. That's the much more common version of monism. And some are idealists. That's the much less common version. The physicalists say we are just one thing. We're just bodies. And the idealists say we're just one thing, we're just souls. Okay, but um, when you look out into the philosophical landscape, there are really just two uh, views. Idealism is held by a very few people, but really not that many. Okay, the great majority of people down through the centuries are either dualists or they're physicalists. And by physicalism, I'm going to use that interchangeably with the word materialism. They think physicalists, materialists think that we're just bodies. We don't have souls. Again, the dualists like Plato and like Descartes think that we have souls and bodies. Okay, Descartes is a dualist. He thinks we have a soul and a body. Now, I want to talk about the metaphysics of moral responsibility issue that arises out of the meditations and out of Descartes' reflections on uh, what the ramifications are of the existence of his soul. Um, what do I mean here? Well, imagine that you are a physicalist or a materialist, and you think that we are just bodies. 
That means that you think that human beings are just something that is subject to the laws of matter and motion that govern the universe. There is no other aspect to us, no non-physical aspect to us that is semi-independent or even wholly independent of the laws of matter and motion that govern the universe. Now, um, the laws of matter and motion that govern the universe ensure that non-conscious things out in the world uh, have no control over what happens to them. This is pretty obvious, right? So the rock not being conscious cannot do anything. It can't make choices. When it is acted upon by a force, it must do what the external force requires it to do. It cannot otherwise control its destiny or control its fate. Okay, and um, if human beings are just physical, and there's no non-physical aspect to human beings, then it's hard to see how a physicalist could say that humans are morally responsible for their choices. This is one of the big critiques of physicalism, and it's something that arises out of Cartesian reflections. It's hard to see how human beings could be held morally responsible for their choices. Um, it's mo Most would agree, down through the centuries, most would agree that uh, moral responsibility is a function of your freedom, the freedom of your will. If your will is free, then you can be held morally responsible something for something. If your will is not free, then you cannot be held morally responsible for something. And this is certainly Descartes' view, and it's one of the reasons why he's a dualist. Descartes thinks there has to be an aspect to human beings outside of just the physical. In other words, not wholly subject to the laws of matter and motion, not just, um, you know, and... and uh, an inert object like this table here or like the chairs we're sitting in. Uh, Descartes thinks there, there must be such an aspect to human beings, a non-physical aspect to human beings, because human beings have a sense of moral responsibility, a sense of right and wrong. And that sense of moral responsibility becomes unintelligible. That is, it cannot be understood unless and until we have free will. If we have free will, then we can be held morally responsible. If we don't have free will, then we cannot be held morally responsible for something. And in circumstances where our wills are compromised in some way, almost everyone would agree that uh, our moral responsibility is also mitigated. Let me give you a couple of case uh, examples just real fast so you guys can get a, a grasp on uh, this idea that our in circumstances where our wills are compromised, our moral responsibility is mitigated. Okay, imagine two different high schoolers. One is a 17-year-old, let's, let's say a 17-year-old girl, who uses hard drugs, cocaine, heroin, the works. She was warned repeatedly for years by those around her not to hang out with the wrong crowd, not to ingest these substances. And yet she did, and now she's got an addiction to these substances. And suppose that she holds up a convenience station, waves a gun at a clerk, demands uh, the cash from the cash register. The clerk, uh, the clerk begins complying with the demands, but one thing leads to another, and sometimes in circumstances like that, things get confused. The gun goes off, and she shoots the clerk. Okay, Almost all of us, if we were jury members in a situation evaluating that circumstance, would say, this woman is morally responsible for the shooting of the clerk, even if she was under the influence of an addiction at the time and was desperate. Still, her choice has led to the addiction. Therefore, she is morally responsible. Her will was not compromised in bringing about the addictive behavior and ultimately holding up a convenience station. Okay, now imagine a second 17-year-old girl. 
Okay, she is also addicted to hard drugs. But she was kidnapped at age 14. Uh, and I don't know, uh, so, some difficult life scenario, pimped out in the sex trade or something like that, addicted to these substances by her handlers, against her will. And then she escaped, but she still had the addiction with her, and she's trying to come down off the drugs, but she can't. It's too hard, right? She's desperate for a fix. She holds up a convenience station. The, um, the clerk, in the course of obtaining the cash from the cash register, the things happen and the gun goes off. Okay, if a jury was evaluating the second circumstance, they almost certainly would see it very differently than the first one. Her responsibility would be mitigated by virtue of the fact that her will is not, was not involved in the creation of the addiction. Okay, that's just kind of like a universal legal thing. Almost everybody agrees on that topic. Um, the strong intuition that philosophers have also had down through the centuries is that when human beings are free, and have genuine freedom of the will, they are morally responsible. But when they are not free, they are not morally responsible for something. Okay, and I wanted to actually uh, illustrate this and ask you guys opinions. This could be an application issue for us. Um, ask you guys opinions about if there are ever any circumstances in which a particular uh, action or set of actions might be justifiable. Okay, so again, the metaphysics of moral responsibility issue is the issue about what we have to assume in order to assume that people are morally responsible for their choices. And Descartes is a dualist, and as a dualist, he assumes that we have souls and that our souls are free, even if our bodies are subject to physical limitations. Still, we can choose, and that choice, that freedom of our souls, enables us to be held morally responsible. And I suggested that uh, physicalists, who are the main view other than the dualist view that's available in response to the question, what is a human physicalist? struggle to explain when and why humans should be held morally responsible because they don't think that there's an aspect to us, the soul, that is free of the influences of matter and motion, which seem to be deterministic in the way in which they influence things. Okay, um, and I offered then two examples, just to, to sum this up, I offered two examples suggesting that humans have this strong intuition that when... Um, when we are free to make choices, we can be held responsible, but when we are not free, we cannot be held responsible. Let me, let me go to a very different topic as a way of illustrating this point about the metaphysics of moral responsibility and just ask you guys opinions about this very different topic as a way of exploring the question of whether um, we are ever absolved from moral responsibility in circumstances in which we have free will. Okay, so let's take the topic of suicide, a famous topic down through the centuries, well explored by philosophers for many, many centuries. Okay, suicide traditionally has been um, rejected by philosophers. It's seen as immoral. Um, who, is, who is it an offense against? Like, who is a party that is harmed by this? Yes? God, okay. So actually, let me put, uh, there are three major parties that are traditionally seen as being harmed by suicide. One is God who made us. Family. Okay, the other is uh, others, family and friends, those who are dependent upon us, those who we depend upon, those who have relationships with us. And self. And self, yeah, that's right, yeah. God, others, and self. Okay, and it's, a, it's an offense against self, just like it would be wrong to uh, kill a, an innocent person. So also it's wrong to kill yourself as an innocent person. Okay, so it's uh, traditionally been seen as an offense against God, others, and self. Um, but what about suicide in circumstances where your will is compromised to some extent? Okay, is suicide ever justifiable? Are there ever circumstances that we could think of where... Committing suicide might actually be an honorable thing to do. Yeah. Uh, in the case of, let's say, America, sometimes we discuss policy as a country. And if 
they ever get caught, sometimes they have to, in the sense of them, like, soak in their glasses and mm-hmm. just chewing gum. Mm-hmm. So it could be argued, if they were to be captured and interrogated, they would be, um, they would be bad for America, it would be bad for us. So could compromise others, they could, their, de- uh, their interrogation could lead to the deaths of many, so maybe it would be justifiable. Yeah, the example I thought of was uh, the Marine jumping in the foxhole on the grenade for his buddies so as to keep them from all dying. We could imagine other such scenarios as well. Okay, um, but this is maybe a case where, again, it's only wrong if it's happening out of your own free will. If your will is compromised... The wrongness of the action seems to be mitigated somewhat. Okay, um, we we say usually in circumstances where some deeply depressed person commits suicide, we say it's a tragedy more than we fault them morally. Because it's a circumstance where um, we wish that some other outcome could happen, but the fact of the, the depression seems to have compromised their ability to think clearly. Ergo, they are not morally responsible. Okay, um, I, I, I offer this as an example of a topic where, uh, we, could, we can think of other similar kinds of topics, a topic where um, agreement is almost universal in the philosophical tradition from Aristotle to Descartes down to the present, that moral responsibility requires freedom and that if you lack freedom, then the level of moral responsibility to which it is legitimate for us to hold you declines accordingly, it diminishes accordingly. The absence of freedom leads to the absence of moral responsibility is the common conclusion. And for this reason, Descartes thinks that we have souls. He he, he thinks we have souls for other reasons as well, but this is a main reason thinks we have souls, and he thinks our souls are free, and he thinks that God gives us genuine freedom so that we can have the real ability to choose our course of action and choose right or wrong for ourselves in a manner that is fully um, fully responsible for what we're doing. Okay, are there any questions or comments about the metaphysics of moral responsibility topic or about what are the underlying conditions that have to be present in order for us to be um, to take responsibility for our actions. Yes. My question is related to Epictetus. Mm-hmm. It's still relating to Descartes. Would he be considered a compatibilist, or they're just saying? Great question. Um, Descartes is uh, almost certainly a compatibilist. Yeah, he makes statements that are uh, statements that are um, ambiguous in that regard. So sometimes he'll say things that seem libertarian. Um, but he more frequently will make compatibilist statements. Both views hold that human beings have free will. The libertarian view explains that relatively easily, but at the expense of divine sovereignty. The compatibilist view explains that more in a more difficult way. It struggles sometimes to explain how, in fact, we do have free will. But it certainly uh, appropriately emphasizes divine sovereignty. He would be a compatibilist uh, on most interpretations. Good question. Other questions? I have...